Rick has been at Penn in the history department for 41 years. Not necessarily a long time for many of us. <laughs> His area of specialization is the period of the American Revolution. During those 41 years, Rick has served as chair of the history department, associate dean in SAS, and dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. Perhaps a measure of the role he has played at Penn is, a is, a is the fact that a Google search of Almanac returns nearly 200 hits. <laughs> Not only has Rick played an important role here at Penn, but he is also instrumental in the founding of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia, and certainly in shaping its exhibits. Rick has been a Fulbright Scholar, a visiting professor at Oxford, and has been nominated for a National Book Award. I could go on and on and on, but instead let me just refer you to Rick's homepage and focus on this afternoon's lecture. Rick has written six books and numerous articles on aspects of America's political and constitutional history in the 18th and early 19th century. His most recent book, Plain Honest Men, The Making of the American Constitution, is the most comprehensive account of the Constitutional Convention to appear in the last half century. It was released by Random House in March 2009. The book takes readers behind the scenes and beyond the debate to show how the world's most enduring constitution was forged through conflict, compromise, and eventually fragile consensus. Recently, Rick appeared on The Daily Show with John Stewart to speak about his book. And in addition to the thousands who saw the show, the video on YouTube has been viewed by nearly 37,000 people. Said so to Vic, this is probably about the same as the number of students he's taken, he's had at Penn over the last 41 years. Rick's book is about what happened over 200 years ago. But as we face today the gridlock and partisanship that's taking place in Washington, the simul similarities are numerous and there are many lessons to be learned. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming one of Penn's real stars, Rick Beeman. Um, uh, first, I just can't tell you how happy I am to be up here addressing this group. Uh, I've actually given, I don't know, it seems like a hundred quote book talks since Plain Honest Men, the Making of the American Constitution was uh, uh, issued a little over a year ago. But I can't imagine uh, a group uh, uh, to old dear friends and, and colleagues in the audience. This is just uh, a, a real treat. Uh, Jay made one mistake in his introduction. Uh, I'm nearing now the end of my 42nd year on the faculty uh, at Penn. I am one year and two months away from retiring uh, all of you in a blissful retirement, courtesy of FIAP. <laughs> um, and I am genuinely uh, looking forward to it. Um, there was a little bit of uh, confusion about what I'd be talking about today. I have a kind of what I call my easy listening talk on, on the book and on political leadership in the Constitutional Convention, which is nicely illustrated by, by some slides of PowerPoint now, I guess. Uh, and I, I was going to give the easy listening uh, talk, but uh, I, I was also toying with another idea, and that was the idea which came out in the email to you. Uh, which is on the Founding Fathers and the myth of the original meaning of the Constitution. It really is a kind of musing on the relationship between our constitutional past and, uh, as Jerry indicated, our very conflicted uh, constitutional present. Um, I've given this particular talk, the one I'm going to give to you, uh, I've given this talk on two previous uh, occasions, only on two previous occasions, uh, one to a rather large group of mostly right-wing lawyers at the Texas State Bar Association, uh, and, and the other to a group of overwhelmingly left-wing academics. 
uh, at Oxford. Um, and, and I think it's fair to say that it went over better in Oxford than it went over in Dallas. <laughs> um, uh, and I have no idea how it would go over with uh, this very enlightened and a uh, group of Renaissance uh, men and women. <laughs> uh, in any case, Anyone who follows uh, the news uh, in America knows that Americans have often had sharply divergent views about how their constitution should be interpreted. And, and indeed, honestly, in my lifetime, I have never seen a time uh, in which public opinion is more polarized, uh, indeed more venomous and venomously articulated uh, about these issues uh, than uh, is the case uh, today. Uh, I, I will, in fact, uh, speculate on, on some of the reasons why I think that is the case in, over the course of this talk. Uh, like nearly everyone else, I have my own opinions on the subject of contemporary constitutional interpretation, perhaps better informed than some and less informed than others. But the main focus of my talk today uh, really is going to be on what the men who drafted the Constitution uh, uh, thought uh, about how their constitution uh, should be uh, interpreted. And I begin with a few very general uh, observations. Those 55 men who gathered in the assembly room of the Pennsylvania State House in the summer of 1787 faced both a familiar and a formidable task. It was familiar in that it was the same task that has confronted virtually every society since the beginning of time that of devising a mode of government capable of preserving uh, order and uh, security on the one hand uh, and, and a fair measure of personal liberty uh, on the other. Uh, uh, a, a challenge actually faced by most societies over most of our history with a heavy-handed dose of order and a minimum of personal liberty. Uh, but their challenge was rendered particularly formidable by the nature of the society for which they were trying to craft this government. Uh, the 13 United States, that small u, small s, United States of America, were in fact profoundly disunited on the eve of the Constitutional Convention. America, by the extraordinary expanse of its territory, by, the ethnic and, uh, by its ethnic and religious diversity, uh, by the existence of 13 independent and sovereign states, each possessing distinct uh, cultural and political traditions and uh, jealous you know, of their own uh, sovereignty and each possessing a multitude of varying and competing interests, America was by no means inevitably meant to be a single nation. Our federal union may seem today as somehow inevitable and inevitably a permanent. Our constitution has turned out to be the most enduring written constitution in the history of the planet. Uh, but none of that was by any means inevitable. Moreover, when we look at the character of the delegates and the way in which they went about their business, it's not at all clear that their work that summer was destined for success. The delegates were, after all, only a small select group of wealthy white males, hardly a group representative of the American populace as a whole, they did their work in secret, insulated from the public whose welfare they were supposed to be serving. Uh, moreover, many of those men differed, sometimes vehemently, uh, over important aspects of the document they were drafting. Uh, and finally, the completed draft of the Constitution that emerged from their convention when submitted to the individual states for ratification was only approved after what was an often bitter and acrimonious debate over many of its most fundamental features. Yet following from these facts is a truly remarkable one. Almost immediately after the Constitution was ratified by the necessary nine of 13 original states, it became the touchstone for what was good and true for virtually every side in every political debate that has ever taken place within our nation. It became, as many before me have observed, the sacred text of America's civil religion. Uh, lacking a common religion or a common ethnicity by which to define our citizenship as Americans, we have seized upon the Constitution as a means by which we define our common uh, national identity. 
And it is precisely because Americans have such reverence uh, for their Constitution that we argue so vehemently about how it should be interpreted. Indeed, Americans began arguing about how their Constitution should be interpreted from nearly the moment that the new government under the Constitution commenced operation. Uh, the initial debate centered around a strict versus broad construction uh, of Article I, uh, Section 8, Paragraph 18, uh, the so-called necessary and proper clause uh, of, of the Constitution. And that uh, debate erupted as early as the early uh, 1790s. Uh, ironically, two of the principal, uh, the two principal authors of the Federalist Papers, Alexander Hamilton on the one hand and James Madison on the other, were the two principal combatants in that argument, with Hamilton arguing uh, for uh, an, a broad construction of the Constitution, uh, Madison uh, arguing for a stricter construction uh, of, of the Constitution. So in this canonical text, the Federalist Papers, which many today use as a, a centrally important guide to how to understand the intent of the framers of the Constitution, uh, two of the principal framers of the Constitution disagreed vehemently within just a few years over a vital passage uh, in that uh, Constitution. Uh, while that debate is still with us, the more general constitutional debate, it seems to me, has widened during the past uh, decade and has become, if anything, even more polarized uh, and more hyperbolic. At one extreme are those like Justice Antonin Scalia who insist that the combination be viewed as a straightforward legal text to be interpreted according to the uh, uh, ordinary or plain meaning of the words on the page as understood by the people of the United States at the time it was drafted. Uh, this is the doctrine of originalism uh, with which uh, Justice Scalia is most closely associated. Uh, Justice Clarence Thomas seems at times to join Justice Scalia in the originalist camp, but at other times reverts uh, to a more old-fashioned notion, uh, namely that we should be guided not by the precise words of the Constitution, uh, but by the original intent uh, of the framers. The doctrine of original intent and originalism are actually not uh, the same thing. With original intent, you've got to kind of psychoanalyze what was going on in their minds, whereas in Scalia's uh, interpretation of the Constitution, you really have to pay close words to the words as they were written uh, on, uh, the, uh, on, the, on the page. Um, there's lo lots of politicians, I, uh, Mitch McConnell has done this frequently recently, uh, often say, I believe in the original intent of the Constitution, and they actually, I'm not sure, have any clear idea of what they mean, but, but they, they think they do. Uh, uh, both justices are openly contemptuous of what they see as the other extreme in constitutional interpretation. Uh, those who would argue that ours is a living Constitution, intended by the founders to be interpreted in like of constantly changing circumstances. Indeed, Clarence Thomas has recently uh, pronounced, and I quote, no matter how ingenious, imaginatively, or artfully put, unless interpretive methodologies are tied to the original intent of the framers, they have no more basis in the Constitution than the latest football scores. There really are only two ways to interpret the Constitution to try to discern as best we can what the framers intended or make it up. Uh, he said this first in a, in a speech at the Oxford Union and then he uh, repeated it in an abbreviated version in an op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, in fact, I don't believe that any of the current justices on the Supreme Court has ever embraced as open-ended a notion of a living constitution as that described by Justice Thomas, but still, we should not uh, minimize the significant intellectual uh, and, and, may I say it, political differences between the two polar ends <coughs> of our current uh, court with uh, Justices Scalia, Thomas, uh, and Alito, and perhaps Justice Roberts, although I don't think Justice Roberts certainly has moved, if you will, to the right uh, <coughs> on the court, although I don't think he's ever articulated quite so pointedly the either the originalist or the original intent doctrine. Uh, uh, those folks occupying one end and uh, Stephen Breyer and Ruth Bader Ginsburg occupying uh, the other. 
The extent of this polarization really is unprecedented in my lifetime. And, and I must say, it, I think it can be laid at the door, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, uh, at the door of Justice Scalia. Um, uh, he's a very, very smart man. Uh, and he is a very logical thinker. And his doctrine of originalism has a kind of simplicity and elegance that makes it very, very attractive. Uh, uh, one of the things I don't like about Justice Scalia's <laughs> advocacy of this is that uh, he not only advocates that, but he imputes uh, to his uh, opponent, his, his intellectual adversaries, uh, a desire to politicize uh, the Constitution. And it does seem to me that the or originalism uh, constitutional philosophy is every bit as political as, as uh, any other. Um, uh, and certainly in the political realm, uh, uh, that, uh, that constitutional philosophy has been picked up, if often misunderstood by various politicians, uh, with a real vengeance. Um, to the extent that uh, the, the Tea Party uh, members, and, and uh, I really do think that the Tea Party movement is a really important movement to which uh, we need to pay not only attention but even some uh, respect, uh, but to the extent that the Tea Parties, you know, have a constitutional philosophy, it is very much, uh, you know, invigorated uh, by the philosophies of Justices Scalia uh, and, and, and Thomas. Uh, the other really notable thing, in, in my view, and I don't know if we've got any uh, law faculty in, in the room, but um, in every major law school in the country now, there are Federalist Societies, which are student-run societies, and these Federalist Societies are very much committed uh, to kind of advocating and promulgating the doctrine uh, of originalism, and the law schools are turning out some very, very bright uh, graduates who are going out in the profession uh, uh, carrying forth this uh, idea of constitutional interpretation. And thus far, uh, the, the people at the other end of the spectrum, Stephen Breyer, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, etc., have not really been able uh, to articulate with this sort of simplicity and elegance their side of that constitutional question. Uh, Stephen Breyer has been instrumental in the founding of another kind of alternative society to the Federalist Society, and, and I'll confess that I can't remember its name even. I know it's got the word constitution in it, but, but the, I think that's a, a, a symptom of the fact that, the, that uh, intellectually in the law schools, uh, those arguing for, for the idea of original meaning are, are really winning uh, the battle. Uh, so with that uh, preface, I, I, I want to ask and then, of course, answer the question, what would the 55 men uh, who uh, gathered uh, in that building uh, down the street from us uh, uh, thought of all of this? Uh, well, anyone who uh, 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 is uh, brave enough to read my book uh, will see that I have a very high esteem. I have a very high opinion of, of, of these men. I'm sure that many of my academic history colleagues think I have too high an opinion of them because they're all, after all, just a bunch of wealthy white males. Um, uh, but, but the more I have studied uh, these men, 18th century men, 18th century politicians by and large, not political theorists or Supreme Court justices, although a few of them went on to become justices, the more convinced I become that there was precious little agreement among them about the plain meaning of the words written on the four parchment pages that 39 of them signed on September 17th. Uh, so now I'm gonna dig into a, a little bit of history. Uh, the framers of the Constitution produced one document over the course of that summer that is particularly pertinent to this ongoing debate. During the period between July 26th and August 5th, 1787, a committee of detail was charged with pulling together all of the various proposals and resolutions and amendments floated during the convention up to that time into a coherent first draft of something that might approximate a proper constitution. A Virginia's governor, Edmund Randolph, was given the task of producing a draft report as a starting point for the committee's work. And he sat, as he set about producing that initial draft, he laid down two principles that are extraordinary to me in the way that they anticipate 
our current debate. The first recognized that the Constitution should deal with essential principles only, lest the operations of government should be clogged by rendering, them, rendering those provisions permanent and unalterable. For they ought to be accommodated by changing times and events. The second of the principles enjoined the delegates to use simple and precise language and general propositions. Uh, and then went on to say that uh, the construction of a constitution of necessity uh, differs from that of law. The first of these principles gives support to those uh, a contemporary jurists and constitutional scholars who argue that ours is a living constitution that must be interpreted in light of changing times and circumstances. The second of Randolph's principles supports, in part at least, those jurists and scholars who argue for an originalist interpretation of our Constitution, insisting uh, that the only to remain true to the vision of the framers was to interpret the precise words of the Constitution in the manner in which they would have been understood by 18th century uh, Americans. Although I would note uh, that that second phrase does make a very important distinction uh, uh, between the construction of a constitution which of necessity differs from that of law. Our constitution is indeed a legal document, but it is also surely a political uh, uh, document. Uh, well, of the two principles, uh, the second would prove, uh, the, to the simple and precise language, would prove much more difficult to uphold. It was one thing to aspire to that simple and precise language, but as the delegates continued to disagree about both the substance and subtleties of much of the constitutional language they were drafting, the plain meaning of their words would often prove confounding. And I'd like to illustrate this difficulty with reference to two of the most contentious issues confronted by the delegates, uh, the precise meaning of the concept of federalism uh, and the nature and extent uh, of executive power, uh, two issues obviously which we argue about still today. Uh, one of the central features uh, of the Virginia Plan, drafted by James Madison, which some of you may remember, uh, formed at least the basis for the initial discussions of a radically altered uh, central government, one which essentially scrapped the old Articles of Confederation uh, and created a national government uh, uh, in, in its place, uh, a national government with a bicameral uh, legislature. And as a means of assuring that that legislature would be representative of the people of the nation at large rather than of the individual states, uh, Madison proposed that representation in both houses be apportioned uh, according to population. Uh, rather than the prevailing method, which was equal representation for each state in a single house legislature. The delegates haggled over uh, the issue of the means of apportioning representation in the legislature off and on for more than six weeks, from May 30th to July 16th. Uh, predictably, those from large populous states argued that there should be proportional representation, while those from smaller states argued for equal representation. Uh, in mid-June, William Patterson of New Jersey presented uh, his alternative, the New Jersey Plan, uh, calling for a purely federal rather than a national government uh, with a single house legislature in each, in which each state was to have equal representation. Uh, the protracted debate over these alternatives was an unedifying, unattractive affair. Really, the first six weeks of the convention, uh, aside from the opening moments when Madison introduces this revolutionary plan for a drastic change in the government, they're really tough going. Uh, it was a, 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 an un, a unedifying, unattractive debate. It was a debate further muddled by the question of how slaves should be factored in the formula for representation and, of course, unsatisfactorily resolved in that debate. All in all, it was a debate that was nearly entirely about the self-interest of individual states. Uh, not about high-flown principles of justice or governance. The compromise that eventually emerged, championed most energetically by the delegates from Connecticut, uh, was an obvious one, so obvious that it was proposed off and on by several delegates almost from the very beginning 
uh, of the convention. Of course, the system that we operate under, for better or worse today, uh, uh, representation in the House uh, apportioned according to population, equal representation uh, in the Senate. But men like James Madison of Virginia and Governor Morris and James Wilson of Pennsylvania were adamant in refusing to accept the compromise. Madison was convinced that the very principle of a national government based on the sovereign will of the people demanded that the new constitution be founded on the principle of proportional uh, representation. As a good many constitutional scholars today would continue to argue, Madison's conception of what we have come to call federalism was, at least during the Constitutional Convention, based firmly on national, not federal, principles. As the debate over apportioning representation dragged into July, uh, more and more delegates seemed inclined to accept the compromise proposed by the Connecticut uh, delegates, and finally on July 16th, by a narrow vote of five states in favor, four uh, opposed, including Virginia and Massachusetts, I'm sorry, Virginia and Pennsylvania, opposing, uh, the delegates agreed to the Connecticut Compromise. Madison was disconsolate. He was convinced that the compromise would destroy the very character of the national government he hoped to create. And indeed, the very next morning, he and several other large state delegates met to consider whether they should leave the convention altogether. In the end, they thought the better of it and grudgingly accepted the compromise. Uh, uh, but even after the convention had adjourned, Madison was unreconciled to the compromise. Writing to Thomas Jefferson, who was still serving in Paris as American ambassador, Madison, uh, Madison continued to complain uh, that his conception of the government had been essentially destroyed by the Connecticut Compromise. He was not a happy camper about this. In fact, though, when faced with the task of selling the new Constitution to a skeptical electorate fearful of the overriding power of an overly centralized national government, Madison managed to turn what he had initially considered one of the Constitution's principal defects into one of its principal virtues. And during the debate over ratification of the Constitution, Madison used his defeat in the controversy over representation to fashion an entirely new definition of federalism. In Federalist 39, he defended the proposed new constitution against his critics by praising the different modes of representation in the House and the Senate, arguing now that the House was representative of the people of the nation at large and the Senate was representative of the residual sovereignty of the states. This now for Madison became one of the features of the new government that made it part national and part a federal. Uh, indeed, an entirely new definition of federalism. In fact, though, no one, including Madison, had any idea of how this new definition of federalism would work in practice. And once the new government commenced op uh, operation, that unanswered question remained a source of bitter contention settled ultimately not by Supreme Court justices, but by the force of arms in bloody combat in the Civil War. The original meaning of federalism uh, was murky uh, in the extreme. Uh, it's interesting to know that that debate is still very much wish it, with us today, and people on both sides of the political spectrum will hop over uh, to one side or the other. So for example, uh, those who are in favor of strong gun control uh, laws are very skeptical of Supreme Court rulings that might suggest that the provisions of the Second Amendment have been incorporated into the, uh, uh, into the Constitution uh, and that the federal government uh, has a right to restrict the right of states and localities uh, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to regulate uh, guns. Uh, you know, on, on, on the other side of this, uh, there is really in conjunction with the Tea Party movement uh, the emergence of the Tenthers, uh, the Tenth Amendment Society, those who want to reinvigorate the Tenth Amendment, which uh, of course says that all power not specifically delegated to the federal government is reserved uh, to the states. So uh, that debate, uh, although it appeared to be settled uh, in fairly dramatic fashion during the Civil War, uh, pops up again uh, and again.
If the delegates carried with them widely disparate understandings of the meaning of the word federalism, their understanding of the meaning of that phrase necessary and proper, the specific phrase is that Congress shall have power to make all laws necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers, uh, their understanding of the meaning of that was nearly non-existent. Uh, the so-called necessary and proper clause uh, uh, was inserted into the Constitution by the a committee uh, of detail. It was adopted uh, by the convention with no debate uh, whatsoever. Uh, during the debate over ratification, some opponents of the Constitution pointed to it as a potentially dangerous entering wedge for the expansion of central government uh, power, but most Americans uh, simply gave this vitally important piece of constitutional language uh, no thought whatsoever. Uh, once again, the historical record gives us no clue as to the ordinary or plain meaning attached to the phrase necessary and proper. The debate over the nature and powers of the executive branch was even more confused than that over the structure and powers uh, of Congress. And, and, and uh, out of uh, concern for your well-being, I'm going to give an abbreviated uh, version of the longer talk that I gave both to the Texas lawyers and the Oxford academics uh, on this subject. Of course, it's an it's a extremely important and controversial ones, but let me just give you at least some of the uh, the, the bare uh, details. Uh, the first sentence of Article 2 of the Constitution is both remarkably simple and maddeningly vague. The executive power shall be vested in a President of the United States of America. But what did executive power mean? A few delegates, James Wilson and Governor Morris of Pennsylvania foremost among them, argued for a strong executive capable of giving energy, dispatch, and responsibility, that those are their words, to the government. Toward that end, they urged their fellow delegates to give the president an absolute veto over congressional legislation. At the other end of the spectrum, Roger Sherman of Connecticut spoke for many delegates when he declared, and I quote, that the executive magistracy was nothing more than an institution for carrying out, the carrying the will of the legislature into effect. And this led Sherman to the conclusion that the president could be removed from office at pleasure any time a majority of members of the legislature disagreed with him on an important issue. Had Sherman had his way, we really would have had a parliamentary system of government with a prime minister removable any time he uh, lost a majority in, in, in the parliament. George Mason kept calling uh, uh, our Congress the Parliament throughout the Constitutional uh, Convention. Uh, James Madison kept changing his mind. His initial version of the Virginia Plan called for the President to be elected by and answerable to the Congress. Although supposedly one of the foremost proponents of the doctrine of separation of powers, he muddled things by proposing a merging of the executive and judicial powers in a council of revision composed of both the president and a, quote, convenient number of the national uh, judiciary. A council empowered, and I quote, to examine every act of the national legislature before it shall, be, shall operate. Uh, if Madison's, and he kept proposing this again and again, it kept getting voted down, but he really wanted this to pass. Uh, had he been successful, uh, this council of revision would have been the agency responsible for what we today call judicial review, uh, rather than uh, the, the Supreme uh, Court. Madison gradually came around to the idea that the executive and judicial functions should uh, uh, be uh, separated, uh, but he continued to favor some form of presidential election uh, by the Congress uh, well into late August. The framers conception of the president's powers in time of war, uh, obviously a hot-button subject these days, was even fuzzier. An initial version of Article 2, Section 8 gave to Congress the power to make war. The framers aimed for greater precision when they amended that phrase to read, declare war. Uh, but there's little evidence suggesting that they intended to transfer all power to make war uh, to the president in his capacity. Uh, as a commander and, and chief. And there are a number of provisions in the Constitution uh, which do give to Congress a, a role in appropriating funds and uh, regulating the, 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 the management of our armed uh, forces. 
uh, uh, you know, uh, one, quite simply though, the framers failed to draw a precise line between the authority of Congress uh, and the president uh, in, in time uh, of war. Uh, uh, it would be wonderful if they gave us a, a certain guide to those difficult uh, judgments uh, that both our president and Congress must make, but, but they did not. September 17th, the day that the delegates affixed their signatures to the document, was hardly the end of the national discussion about the new Constitution. Until the people of the uh, individual states added their assent to the proposed document, it remained nothing more than opinion, without force of law. The contest over ratification, the one opportunity that the American people uh, had to render their opinion on the issues that I've just mentioned, uh, that debate served only to further confuse the original meaning of the words on the four parchment pages of the Constitution. Although the ratification uh, debates produced some admirable political writing, the most uh, notable among them, of course, being the 85 essays that comprise the Federalist Papers, uh, by and large, those debates were, first and foremost, highly partisan attempts at political mobilization. More often than not, they produced political propaganda not high-flown political theory. As both Federalists and Anti-Federalists sought to win voters to their sides, clear and precise understandings of the text of the Constitution gave way to obfuscation. The ratification debates, although they may be justly celebrated as America's first popular referendum, as I, I think they indeed were, but the ratification debates were hardly the vehicle for discerning the original meaning of the document drafted by the framers. On so many fundamental issues, the powers granted under the Commerce Clause, the meaning of the Necessary and Proper Clause, the functional meaning of general welfare uh, in, in the list of Congress's uh, powers, the range of opinions expressed in the camps of both opponents and supporters of the Constitution was so vast as to make the plain meaning of any of those clauses nearly incomprehensible. Given the framers' confusion and disagreement over issues even so basic as the meaning of federalism and the extent of executive power, it shouldn't surprise us, because they were 18th century, not 21st century politicians, that they were appropriately modest about predicting any degree of permanence for the document they had drafted that summer. Time after time, one delegate or another rose to express skepticism about whether the document they were crafting would last beyond their lifetimes. In the debate over the proper ratio of representatives to constituents in the House of Representatives, for example, James Madison worried that if the union should be permanent, an inflexible ratio of one to every 40,000 inhabitants, that was the proposal being debated at the time, uh, that that ratio would render the number of representatives in time excessive. Nathaniel Gorman of Massachusetts responded with incredulity. Can it be supposed that the government under this Constitution will last so long as to produce this effect? Can it be supposed that this vast country will 150 years hence remain one nation? Madison was, of course, correct in voicing his concern about in asserting an inflexible ratio of represent representation into the Constitution, uh, for if the delegates had insisted on it, uh, our House of Representatives today would uh, a number about 7,500 members, a pretty scary thought. Um, uh, uh, but the fact that Madison prefaced his remarks with if, and Gorham, a strong supporter of a strong uh, national union, would regard the likelihood of its lasting 150 years with incredulity, speaks volumes about the fragility of the new union the framers were struggling uh, to create. As I've indicated, even Madison, an author, if not the author of the Constitution, had changed his mind about many features of the document during the course of the convention. Moreover, his original intentions about the powers of the new government underwent even more dramatic change in the years to come as he became a, a really a rather rigid, strict uh, constructionist. 
Yet Madison was profoundly respectful of history and tradition. In Federalist 49, he had written approvingly uh, of that veneration which time bestows on everything, and without which perhaps the wisest and freest governments would not possess the requisite stability. Madison's close friend and political ally, Thomas Jefferson, was of a very different temperament. In a remarkable letter written to Madison just before he returned from France in 1789, Jefferson took up the question of whether one generation of men has a right to bind another. Jefferson answered in the negative. The earth belongs to the living. The dead have neither power nor right over it. Applying that belief to the durability and immutability of constitutions, Jefferson asserted that no society can make a perpetual constitution or perpetual law. The earth belongs always to the living generation. They may manage it then and what proceeds from it as they please. However much Madison may have respected the intellect of his Virginia neighbor, he was not ready to jettison history and tradition so easily. Responding to Jefferson, he acknowledged that his friend's argument might have some merit in theory, but in practice, he said, it seems liable to some very powerful objections. A government so often revised, Madison objected, would become too mutable to retain those prejudices in its favor, which antiquity inspires. Madison feared that constant revisions in the form of government, depending merely on the whims of public opinion in a particular age, would weaken the fabric of the Union. It would be far preferable, Madison thought, if the Constitution were more fir firmly rooted in the prejudices of those men with whom he had gathered in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. But Jefferson stuck to his guns. Writing some 25 years later, he reiterated his skepticism about the permanency of constitutions. Some men, Jefferson noted, look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence uh, and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human. Suppose what they did to be beyond amendment. I knew that age well. I belonged to it and labored with it. It deserved well of its country. But I know also that laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of the human mind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, as new discoveries are made, new truths disclosed, and manners and opinions change with the change of circumstances, institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. Madison had participated in nearly every minute of the deliberations of the convention. He had witnessed the bitter disagreements, the displays of personal ambition and pettiness, and he knew well the diversity of opinion among the members of the convention as to the meanings of the words written on those four parchment pages. Madison's constitution, he knew it well, was certainly no divinely inspired text directly delivered from heaven. Nevertheless, he believed to the very end of his life that the Constitution created that summer, though not perfect, was the best that any group of men could ever devise. And perhaps influenced by his pride in his own authorial role and by his veneration of tradition, Madison continued to defend the timeless quality of his achievement. There is, it seems to me, a middle course between Jefferson's timeless constitution uh, and Jefferson's protean one. We would be devaluing the extraordinary accomplishments of the Founding Fathers if we did not accord their constitution the veneration that such a time-tested document deserves. But in the egalitarian and democratic spirit of Jefferson, we must have faith in the wisdom of the citizens of our own age to guide our continuing political experiment down paths that will ensure that we fulfill the promise of our other great revolutionary document, Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. Jefferson came to appreciate the achievement of those who created what I call in the book the Revolution of 1787. He saw it as an important step, but just a step toward securing the blessings of liberty promised in his own Declaration of Independence.
In the Jeffersonian sense, the revolution of 1787, like that of 1776, continues even today. In that sense, it truly is we the people of the United States, not the founding fathers, nor Supreme Court justices, who are the ultimate stewards of our Constitution. It truly is we the people who are the ultimate stewards of that Constitution. We can only hope that in this overheated, often venomous, social environment in which we live and operate today, that we, the people, uh, will rise to that task. Thank you very much. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. Yes? Those are very uh, thoughtful comments. It seems to me that today, with the movement uh, away from the uh, away from the, uh, Washington, away from the people's distaste with Washington, the voters' distaste with uh, the, uh, the federal government, the movement towards the states, back towards the states, is, uh, is, is a move uh, which agrees with your uh, movement against the federalism. And similarly, perhaps in this administration as well as the administration that preceded it, the abuse of, uh, of executive power uh, and, the, uh, and the feeling of the people uh, about that is again uh, a movement of the way. Well, I mean, the, the, one of the the, 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 the the people most unhappy of, about what's going on in Washington, actually, most, I think everybody's unhappy about what's going on in Washington. Though the one remarkable thing, you know, I, uh, I've been thinking about writing this book for 40 some years. It's always been the subject closest to my heart, but I've only wrote it in the last four years. And I happen to write it at a time when the Constitution is more immediate and more relevant. It seems that way to people's lives than ever before. However much people disagree on how it should be interpreted, we all agree uh, that, is, uh, that it is important. And so those very people who believe that our Constitution is being trashed by the, by the current administration, uh, I should find some comfort in the fact that, that all Americans just care so very deeply about this document. I will just issue one caution about returning power to the, to the state legislatures. Uh, I, I had dinner last night. I'm actually somewhat ashamed to admit this. I had dinner. Uh, last night uh, with a, a group of lobbyists from the drug industry, each of whom is responsible for log lobbying on behalf of their industry, uh, individual state legislatures. And they were very interested in hearing about the, the Constitutional Convention and, and the art of compromise and why is it so difficult to get compromise in the Congress today and uh, uh, why, why the Founding Fathers were so and when you think about it, remarkably successful uh, then. Um, and, but, but what I heard from them is that this partisanship that has so infected our National Congress and has so gridlocked our, our government uh, has also uh, now infected the state legislatures as well. Uh, so that I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the alternative of quote, returning power to the states, is in all cases, it may very well be in some cases, uh, the, the, the right move, but, but perhaps not uh, in all cases. But, but again, that's a, a discussion which has oscillated over the course of the nearly 225 years. Yes, sir. How did the court get in the business of interpreting the law? Um, that, isn't that a, a lawmaking problem? Uh, well, hmm. and what does that have to do? Yeah. How does that occur in the separation? No, nowhere, nowhere in the Constitution. Well, let, let me ask a question from a history professor and get a long answer. That's probably true of any professor. Um, longest article in the Constitution is Article One. It's about the legislative branch because they all consider the legislative branch the most important branch. Next longest article to the executive branch. Uh, article three, tiny little article on the judicial branch, which leaves the powers of the judiciary entirely undefined uh, and says nothing about judicial review. Alexander Hamilton in Federalist 78 uh, does uh, assume this power of judicial review uh, and, and, and 
I, I think most constitutional scholars would agree that most of the delegates to the convention in, in, meant to impute some power of judicial review to the federal courts, culminating with the Supreme Court. Um, what should the extent of that power of judicial be, review be? Uh, when John Marshall initially articulated in 1803 in Marbury v. Madison, overturning uh, a federal law, the Judiciary Act of 1789, he did so on very narrow grounds, and it really related more to the relationship between the, the three branches of government than it did to a, a sweeping power of uh, overturning a, a federal law. The, the next federal law that was overturned, by the way, by the Supreme Court, was overturned in 1857 in the infamous Dred Scott decision, which overturned the Missouri Compromise uh, of 1820. Most of the trend, uh, uh, the, the trend of, quote, judicial activism, uh, uh, which the Marshall Court spearheaded, was over overturning state laws uh, and the asserting of the primacy of, of federal power over state power in, in, a, in a number of commercial and economic cases. So, I mean, the, the process of, I would say, the elevation of the Supreme Court to a nearly equal status with the executive and legislative branches has been a gradual one and it has also uh, been an oscillating one. Uh, I, I, I think most constitutional scholars would say um, that the period of the Warren Court in the 1950s and 1960s was a particularly active time, but what's really pretty interesting is that uh, neither the Berger nor Rehnquist courts dramatically slowed down. And it's really only, uh, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years that, that, that we've seen, for example, Supreme Court confirmation discussions uh, assume the highly ideological character that they have. That's a very, very shorthand view of our constitutional history. What's Franklin's contribution to the Constitution? Uh, I'm very glad you asked that question. <laughs> uh, Franklin uh, was 87 years of age uh, at the time of the convention. He was, um, along with Washington, the most distinguished delegate. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I'm wrong. He was 81 years of age at the time of the, the convention. Um, he obviously had a distinguished career. He was revered by his fellow delegates. And he also tended to drift in and out of senility during his many interventions uh, in the convention. And he made a series of genuinely wacky proposals uh, in the convention, one of them being that um, the best way to uh, select Supreme Court justices was to hold an election in which only the lawyers of the country would vote. <laughs> and the, his idea was that the lawyers in the country would select the ablest among them in order to get rid of their competition. <laughs> uh, and that then you would have the able, most ably composed Supreme Court. You know, the delegates kind of rolled their eyes heavenward and said, thank you very much, Dr. Franklin, that's most interesting. And they moved on to, to other business. But on the final day of the convention, uh, uh, and when it was time for the delegates to step up and decide whether or not to sign this document, uh, Franklin uttered the, the, the wisest political words ever spoken. If Nancy Pelosi and John Boehner and Mitch McConnell and uh, 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 all the rest, which uh, um, I'm sorry, I'm having a senior moment. <laughs> uh, Senator Reid would, uh, would 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 heed uh, this advice. Uh, Franklin noted that whenever you assemble a group of men uh, in order to collect their accumulated wisdom, you also assemble with those men all of their passions, their prejudices their selfish interest in differing ideological points of view. And he said, from such a gathering of men can a perfect production ever be expected. And then he went on to say that there were many features of the proposed Constitution of which he did not approve. 
Um, but the longer he lived, the more he learned that in the fullness of time, many of his views turned out to be uh, in incorrect. And he then asked the delegates, this is the, this is the injunction that I wish members of our Congress today would heed. He asked the delegates to doubt a little their own infallibility, uh, to cast aside their kind of self-righteous determination to make the perfect the enemy of the good. Uh, and, and to sign the document. And in that spirit, 39 of the 42 delegates, uh, uh, um, uh, Elbridge, Gerry, uh, Elbridge Gerry, uh George Mason, and Edmund Randolph, the three dissenters, uh, stepped up and, and, and signed the document. So, so Franklin's uh, 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 greatest contribution came at the very end. Uh, his other contribution was just being there. And aside from missing the first day when he suffered from a bout of kidney stones, he was there every single day. Any other questions? Maybe just one more question. What is your opinion of well, uh, uh, okay, and I'll try not to make this too long an answer. So, um, so I, I, I hope you've gathered that my answer to Justice Scalia is, you're wrong. Uh, where are you going to, you know, determine the uh, plain meaning of those words when the founding fathers themselves or nobody in the 18th century could agree on that original meaning. And in fact, I have been in a small gathering with Justice Scalia in which in very polite and humble tones, I put that to him. And um, he quickly responded, as he has responded to this many times, what's your alternative, Professor Bean? Uh, just make it up. Uh, and, and he said, I have an alternative, it's the amendment process. Uh, and, and it is indeed that the framers did uh, uh, prescribe uh, one process for accommodating the Constitution to changing times and circumstances, a very arduous and difficult amendment process, and we do in fact have very few uh, of those amendments. But anybody looking back on our constitutional history knows that it has changed, and it has changed by and large for the better outside of the amendment process. Uh, uh, Justice Scalia would have a very hard time, I think, although he's a smart man, so I'm sure he'd find a way to do it, uh, for example, uh, uh, for, for, for justifying uh, the decision in Brown v. Board of Education in, in 1954. Uh, but clearly, the nation is better off for Brown v. Board of Education. So, but, but so the amendment process certainly does have a place in the ongoing uh, evolution of our Constitution, but I don't think it's, it's the only place. Good day. And I think that we're all better off for having listened to Rick this afternoon. And I thank you. I think we should thank, thank you. Thank you very much.